How we doing? FC Live, Braun at Frazier's, and we have Borgata with AJ the next day. But we're not all about, but a lot about Hall of Fame today, too, which we're excited for. We'll talk yeah. through it. Looks like some dudes are going to get in, which is great. We're going to talk to Ken Rosenthal coming up in just a sec, so AJ can give him shit. But really, it's anything that you know AJ has a problem with, he can say something to Ken and be like, you writers, like this is one of those days where you can really, really say, you you writers all think this. Yeah. <laughs> you people that all root for your certain teams, you know, you guys all think this, but you say you don't. Exactly. A little biased action, maybe. You know, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. You guys did that. I mean, this is one of those cases where I'm sure if you followed in the off season when you guys were playing and you see, you know, who gets voted in or out, you're like, oh, the, the writers get to control the yeah, vote they, here. They do course. have the vets committee, too, for people to know. Like, even if you don't get voted in, eventually you can get voted in later on. And that actually includes but, someone who we'll speak to later. Roger Clemens is on our guest list today, too. But, but I mean, listen, Freddie, you know this. It's also a popularity contest. Let's not, yeah. let's not, you know, kid ourselves here. You know, Gary Sheffield... There are people that won't vote for him because he might have yelled at him when he was doing a you know, question <laughs> yeah. and answer after going 0 for 4. So they're like, oh, this guy was a dick once. I'm not going to vote for him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tarnish his legacy. Things like that. So oh, it yeah. also matters what kind of person you are and if you were nice to everybody. And listen, that shouldn't be involved. But in baseball, people get their feelings hurt really easily. That That's like life in general. Like, yeah. Like you, people hold receipts. We talk about that all the time. You hold a receipt. But listen. I call them small potatoes. You get an argument with a guy. I'm the guy that comes next week when I come back home. Hey, listen, whatever happened last week, you know, you had a bad day, I had a bad day. Let's put it behind us. That's how I've always been. And most people can't do that. So, uh, yeah, 100 percent. You know, you, you got to be nice to everybody now. Be it, careful. It's not just the Hall of Fame, though. Think about this, right? I'm sure there's players you've played with. Now, performance obviously matters. you got to be a big leaguer. Yeah. But I'm sure there's players you've played with where some teams are like, this guy's great. We want to have him around. He's, yeah. he's not our best, right? He might be the end of the bench, but he's great to have around. Uh, versus the other side of that, too. This guy's a pain in the ass. It's not worth it. And a very recent example. Matt Carpenter had a great run. And two years ago was really good. Signs a deal with the Padres. He was really bad last year. Is there a chance that he's just okay with the Cardinals and they want to have someone because they've lost so many vets in such a short period of time, AJ, where it's like, bueno has gone. Obviously, Yachty and that factor two years ago. I mean, they've lost a lot and to bring Cart back might be a little bit of a helpful infusion of veteran presence. I don't think they're expecting him to be a stud at the plate. Oh, absolutely. That's why they would do that. I mean, that's the whole reason. He was there in their glory years too, don't forget. So they, they want to get back to, to guys that had no winning. Listen, they brought Lance Lynn back too. Right, another guy that let, was there, left, and went away, uh, went away, yeah. and came back. So, uh, certain teams do this more than other teams, and I'm all for it because teams that want to win, they need veteran guys around. They need veteran presence to help their young guys through situations because all teams are going to have young guys, but you need guys that can go up to a young guy in a positive way and say, "Hey, man, it's okay. You're going to get through this. It's a bad slump. Oh, you're 0 for 15. It's okay. You're good enough to be here." Or you made an error. Okay, this is what you say to the reporters. Whatever it is, you need those presents, and teams have gotten away from that, especially teams that aren't very good. The teams that win have these guys. They have them around. Whether it's on the bench, whether it's playing every day, whatever it is, the good teams have veteran presence, and I think more teams need it. Yeah, and hey, we spent a lot of time, so you can just look back to yesterday's episode if you want on Anthony Rendon. Not saying like he's destroying a clubhouse or anything, but that's not a guy no. you're signing being like he's going to set a great example. Like you know what I'm <laughs> no. saying? So just something to pay attention to where teams do their homework one way or the other. Let's charge the damn mound, powered by T's. We got a big day, we got a lot of good guests, obviously on the list, and we did have some signings. So let's start with this one because some fans were freaking out. They were like, Pittsburgh, what? Araldis Chapman is now joining the bullpen, not to close. Because that job belongs to the all-star David Bednar. But there it is. Ken uh, reporting on this one last night in agreement with the Pirates on a one-year $10.5 million bucks for Araldis Chapman, who about triples his salary from 2023. He was a little over $3 million bucks for 23. Signs with KC. He resurrected his career. He was great. Fastball below the whole deal back up, Todd Father. And, mm -hmm. and then KC flipped him and actually got Cole Reagans, who looks like he might be like a number one or two starter. So it worked out for everyone. And Pittsburgh's trying to replicate that. Yeah, and I think he's still got some juice left in the tank. Uh, from playing with him for two different teams, 
I know his lifestyle. I know the way he goes about it. He's a strong person. He throws the ball hard. He kind of tinkered with his delivery last year a little bit. I saw him during the playoffs with Texas, and uh, he kind of turns and comes down a little more to get a little more push off that backside. And he said, Poppy, you know, something different. I got to change. You know, I can't just keep throwing hard, hard, hard. I got to keep trying to hide the ball. And I said, that's a great idea. He did well. And I think it's a great pickup for Pittsburgh. It's another key cog for them, two guys, seventh, eighth, ninth inning that can come in and help out this team. You know, is Pittsburgh's going to win it all? Probably not. But this is a good start for them and maybe another trade piece down the road too as well. So you got to look at both sides. Yeah, I know AJ is going to say. <laughs> yeah. what don't you, buy a house famous in Pittsburgh. Line? <laughs> don't buy a house in Pittsburgh, Mr. Chapman, because you and Rowdy and uh, whoever else, what other, who else they have? Probably Marco Bednar Gonzalez. as well, yeah. Uh, I mean, you guys, there's a good chance by come June or July, whoop, you guys are packing your shit, you're out the door. So, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it's great for a role to get $10.5 million. This is a great thing for Pittsburgh. At least they're trying to spend some money. I know Bob Nutting came out and said the Pirates are going to be competitive this year. They still need more pieces. They still need more offense. They still need more pitching. But it's a nice piece. But, again, these guys, as a veteran guy, listen, you can go anywhere for three months, and you can survive for three months anywhere. Aroldis Chapman will go there for three months. If they're not in it, guess what? Bye-bye, Aroldis. You're going to go to some team, and both times that he's won a World Series, guess what he did? He got traded in the middle of the year. So it can happen. It's happened before, and it will happen again if Pittsburgh's out of it. So, I mean, again, you go anywhere for three months, and Aroldis Chapman is trying to prove it again. And Chapman's on the, or I say should say Pittsburgh is on the Baltimore Orioles plan, mm-hmm. right? Hey, <clears throat> we're we're gonna scrap it all down, which they did years ago already at this point, and we are just gonna have a bunch of young, exciting players that cost sub one million dollars. So until you get to that point, I actually think a key piece of rebuilding is adding veterans, which costs a little bit of money, like Chapman does. So you can flip them for prospects. I'll reiterate this. The most exciting young player on the Kansas City Royals is Bobby Witt Jr. Their most exciting young pitcher is Cole Reagans. They did not draft him. They barely developed him. Although when they brought him over, they did make some tweaks and it helped him. So that's what Pittsburgh needs to do. You can't just draft and develop if you want to completely flourish. In my mind, or give you yourself a much better chance. Especially now in the lottery era, Right. Now, it's not just, oh, I have the worst wet record, auto, I'm going to pick first, or I'm a bottom three team. You can only do that so much. So this is another reason why you do have to at least spend a little bit of money to help yourself out to eventually get Pittsburgh to that Baltimore status. Yeah, and I think, you know, you think about the contract, one year, 10 and a half, give or take, I think that's around the ballpark for him. I mean, he's he's on the latter years of his career, but he's still throwing 95 plus. He's a guy that has has developed a, a slider and I, I think like a split change, if I'm not mistaken, some kind of change up. And, um, you know, he's gotten better. You know, he's he's that guy. He's that Cuban missile. So he's going to keep doing that. And I think uh, a pretty good deal for both sides. Yeah, I mean, Stevenson, Robert Stevenson, got essentially 11 million bucks a year for three years. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Stevenson is coming off a dynamite second half of the season yeah. and, and different pitchers. And Chapman, I, I guess the ding against him, AJ, primarily in terms of what he does on the field is he has those stretches during a season where he just falls apart, can't find the zone. And then even in the playoffs, like he actually was pretty effective. It was, I think it was two runs in eight innings, but you do feel like you're entering a roller coaster when he hops on the mound. But sometimes it's like it's two pitches way out of the zone and then he gets you on three pitches right after that. So he's entertaining for me to watch. If if it's not my team, I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> you know, I, listen, he's, he's one of those nail biter closers, you know, high wire acts, whatever you want to call him. But he's gotten it done a long time, and he's saved a lot of big games, and he's he's blown some big games too. But listen, he, he still throws hard, like Todd said. And, and remember last year how great he was at the Royals, and that's why the Rangers went out. Remember the Rangers struck early for him. It was like May, I think, or end of May where they went out and got him for, for Cole Reagans. And, and he, when he got over to Texas, he was okay, and then he just lost pitching. He just didn't pitch for a long time because he couldn't throw a strike. But, again, he got it back, and people still believe in him, and he still has that aura about him. Best thing that he does, though, when he closes out a game, he doesn't celebrate. He just, like, stands there and stares at you. He's like. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he does. You're like, okay, you got me. I don't. And that dude is, a, is giant. Todd will tell you that. Oh. He is way bigger in person than you think he is when you see him on TV. 
Not many pick bro have bigger biceps than Scooter over here. No, he's he's worlds ahead of me. Tries bias, dude. Thighs. I'm shrimp cocktail for all the <laughs> Chapman. Let me tell you. But the, the last thing I'll say with Chapman that stood out to me when I was just scouring through social media, people were like, "Why would he go there?" Uh, uh, there's one reason. Oh, he loves this restaurant in Pittsburgh. No, <laughs> and it's nothing against Pittsburgh. I like Pittsburgh, but I'm just saying. It's this. It's just this, okay? He just won a freaking World Series title. He felt like he was underpaid last year, which, given his production, he was underpaid last year. So I bet the Pittsburgh Pirates gave him the best or one of the best, most competitive offers. It's that freaking simple, yeah, you know? 100%. I don't think you have to read into it much more. People are like, I didn't see this. And it's like, it's like why? Any, it's like any other job, dude. It's like any when, when you're later in your career, it's like any other job. You're looking for, honestly, you're looking for the most money, and you're yeah. looking for, you know, you want to compete, but still at the same time, you know, at the end of the year, he might have a couple of years left. So it's like, let me make what I can make. And I'm still going to go out there and fight. Don't get me wrong. When I do a job, I'm going to give it to the best of my ability. Just like a guy that works at a desk. Just like a guy that works behind a dish at McDonald's. Listen, you got to work. Yeah. And you got to give it, you got to give it your best shot. And he doesn't care about playing on multiple <laughs> teams. This is his sixth team. And I will say this, this is my little insight. Cause I do know some people that, <laughs> um are tight with chapman he spends money <laughs> he likes money <laughs> so he's gonna go for the biggest offer right if one team's at 10 to 5 and one's at 10 and a half he's probably going there. but again so. you mentioned the money but it still goes back to me yeah it was probably his highest offer but he also knows again there's a good chance if he does well he's going to get traded to a team in contention so i think todd you can go anywhere for three months right scott sure. you could go anywhere for three months and figure it out <laughs> and then know that the back end there could be a reward with a big paycheck I think this is a win-win for both teams, both sides. Yeah. I agree. And, and then the other one that pops up, and we'll get Ken's thoughts in a minute here, but first to you guys. Did you know the Dodgers signed a player? Yet another? Oh, no. Charity signed Paxton. Otani. Oh. Yeah, and Yamamoto, and Teoscar Hernandez, and traded for Tyler Glass now. Just but another chip. Why not a little James Paxton <laughs> action? Which to me, actually, AJ, is a classic Dodger signing because they will sign these guys that have upside, that have dealt with injuries. There's some years where they've got like three, four pitchers stacked on the IL, and and sometimes none or, or maybe only one of them pops up. But Paxton has this stuff, and we've talked about this, that if he's healthy for the playoffs, can he pitch a playoff game for you? He yeah. could if he's healthy, but that's yeah. the problem. Plus, this dude had a bald eagle land on him once and didn't flinch, which is awesome. Didn't even flinch. I remember when he was in Seattle. But, I mean, yeah, this is just another piece for the Dodgers. We keep talking about how thin their rotation is. They're just signing multiple – after Yamamoto they're just and Glasnow, now they're just going to start signing guys. And if they get Kershaw back, great. But they're just going to keep signing guys. And if Paxson can't pitch because he's injured, they're like, oh, $11 million. We, we wipe our butt with that every day. We're the Guggenheim, so <laughs> we don't really care. But seriously, they just stockpile talent, stockpile pitchers. And that's why the Dodgers run make, you know, make it to the playoffs every year. They have so much depth. Not only do they have high top end talent, someone goes down, they have someone available that has a little bit of veteran, something going on that can step in, take their place, and they're not afraid to sign these guys. And it's awesome for Dodger fans. Yeah, he barely pitched for a long time. I mean, he had six starts from 2019 to 2022, and he was still on payrolls. For years, so he's done well if you look up how much he's made. But this past season, four and a half ERA, 19 starts with Boston. Trade talks were there, didn't end up happening, um, and it was really in the first 10 starts. Then, then he did dip a little bit and had a knee problem. Also, yes, the injuries have just been endless for him. But first 10 starts at a 2.73 ERA. So, I mean, for the Dodgers, they look for quality. I think that's pretty clear he at got, this point. And I think at the end of the year, he got his fastball velo back, and I think that was. The main thing, because when you're big like that, you have a stature like that. And when I used to face him, he had that hard fastball in and he'd throw that two seamer away. And then he'd come back with a nasty slurve kind of curveball pitch that he kind of lost to as well. So he has to throw that from what I'm reading here a little bit harder. And I think he'll be just fine. Man. It's a lefty. I mean, you can't go wrong with a lefty who's throwing mid 90s. That would be great. But at the same time, if he could find a way to hit those zones and hit those spots and get away with some pitches, which he's he'll be just fine yeah oh man big maple prime james paxton with seattle it's a great nickname too it was really freaking good uh right before we bring on ken here a little shout out to teaser which we'll talk more about coming up too um as roger clemens will join us later for a little tease action but for now discount code foul f-o-u-l for 20 percent off your first order at teaser all right let's keep the combo going on the dodgers for a sec as we 
bring in FT Senior Insider Ken Rosenthal right now. So, Ken, we see the James Paxton signing late last night. It's starting to get a little more activity, starting to get a little warmer with some of these signings. I'm going to guess the answer is no, but were you surprised that the Dodgers added yet another starter? Because as much talent as they've brought in, it's not like you look at their rotation and even their starter depth and go, oh my gosh, it's endless here. The rest of the depth after those first five are those young guys from last year. Right, and there are even young guys in the rotation before Paxton was added. So there are a number of questions in that rotation. If you really break it down, Yamamoto is making the transition to the U.S. It won't necessarily go smoothly. It did for Senga last year, but you can't be assured that that's going to happen. Bueller is coming off Tommy John surgery. Tyler Glass now should be healthy now, but he's had injury problems in the past. Certainly, Emmett Sheehan and Bobby Miller are promising young guys, but they are still young guys. Miller is obviously the guy who made an impact last year. So James Paxton adding to that mix is probably a good idea. And Clayton Kershaw, he still stands a chance of coming back if he wants to come back to the Dodgers. They are in a position where they will still welcome him back because, as you guys mentioned, they'll just be mixing these guys, bringing them in and out of the rotation all season long, and Kershaw can simply be part of that mix. Now, let me ask you this about the whole signing. What do you think about the money? I mean, I feel like nowadays, we're, or not nowadays, but this year, guys are signing a little bit more, I wouldn't say overpriced, but they're getting the deals that they want. You know, you think about a Chapman at 10.5, you think of Paxson at 11. Is there something uh, along the lines of this, or is this just the ongoing thing going and this is what they're worth? Todd, it's no question that starting pitchers in particular have gotten paid really well this offseason. And you go back to Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson. It started there. Frankie Montas got $16 million, barely pitched last year. Now you look at Paxton. He has not, of course, been a very durable pitcher. Teams want the few quality starters who are available. Chapman is a little bit different. People were surprised by the extent of the salary within the game. People within the game were saying, whoa, this was one team in particular. We thought he was more like a five, six million dollar guy, and he got ten and a half from the Pirates. If you look at him analytically, strikeout rate, velocity, all of the things that you can check on his baseball savant page, he was like in the 99th percentile for quite a number of those categories. So that's why he's getting paid. And yes, the numbers for the right players have been high, but as we've discussed, Todd, there are a whole lot of free agents still out there. And they're not all getting paid. That's just the reality of the market, the supply and demand nature of this. I'm sure there are still some good deals out there. There will be. There are still some really good players out there. But we're going to see some guys who get bid a little bit as well. Now, now to finish off that, is there, could the reasoning also be that you look at the guys in the playoffs who didn't have that four or five starter? Is that could be a possible explanation as well? I don't know if the playoffs are the reason for James Paxton. I don't know that okay. you can count on him for October. But what you're looking at in a general sense, Todd, as we speak more broadly, is teams recognizing we can't just have five. That's not going to work. It doesn't work in today's game. You need probably eight to ten to get through a season. They're not always all of them going to pitch the same amount of innings, of course. But from injuries, from the fact that certain guys need breathers, they might be coming off of injuries. There are all kinds of issues that take place, and starting pitchers are not relied on the same way they were years past. They are asked to do less in terms of innings, but in shorter bursts and in bursts that sometimes don't last for 30 to 35 starts a season. That, to me, is what's driving this. Now, when you talk about a Blake Snell or a Yamamoto, guys with elite stuff, those are pitchers who will be asked to start a playoff game, yes, and are asked to be a difference maker in a playoff game. But I don't know that I would attribute this trend to that as much as teams simply recognizing the need and the shortage of pitchers who can take the ball every fifth day. It's kind of a dying breed in our game. Ken, can I take you back to the Kershaw part of this equation for a sec? Because he's been talked about quite a bit, I would say, by fans, especially Dodger fans, hoping that he stays with the Dodgers um, for the rest of his career, which we don't know how much longer he's going to go. He's coming off big surgery. Do you have any inclination on if 
it's Texas or LA, if Texas is even real or it's more just in our heads because he's from Texas. And I'm wondering, you know, if he does sign this off season versus waiting at some point till he's maybe more medically cleared. So any thoughts on what could surface with him? Oh, good question, Scott. Texas is real in the sense that they've talked to him in the past, past free agencies, and they have talked to him again this off season. He is, of course, from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He still lives there, and I'm sure it's entered his mind from time to time. It would be kind of cool to pitch at home, have my kids right there with me instead of having to move them to L.A. for the summer. The other part of that, he's spent his entire career with the Los Angeles Dodgers, and, of course, the idea of retiring as a Dodger has to hold a certain appeal as well. What we know about Kershaw is that he probably won't be even a factor until – after the All-Star game, at the earliest. So I still see him as a Dodger because we don't know where Texas is going with Jordan Montgomery, with their finances in general. Texas would want to sign Kershaw even though they have three other pitchers, all of whom are pretty accomplished. Uh, two of them are in particular, Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom. And then there's Tyler Molly. These guys are all coming back after the All-Star break. So even with that, the Rangers still would sign Kershaw, and even with the possibility of getting Jordan Montgomery, we'll just have to see where this goes. And I imagine, Scott, it is possible that he waits and waits until later in the offseason, even into the season, to make his decision. But I would expect it would come before then. Ken, free agent signings. Aroldis Chapman to the Pirates, $10.5 million. They signed, also signed Rowdy Telez. They made some moves, Marco Gonzalez, some other moves. Bob Nutting came out yesterday and said, we're going to be competitive. Is Aroldis Chapman, Rowdy Telez, Marco Gonzalez enough to make the Pirates competitive? And what the f hell is he talking about? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you forgot Martin Perez. And oh, also, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I don't know if it's enough to make the Pirates competitive. They need their young players to take a step forward. There's no question about that. This is year five under general manager Ben Sherrington. The first of those years, of course, was the COVID season in 2020. And it is time for them to make some progress, show some progress. We saw it the early part of last season, but now we need to see more, I would think. More pointedly, owner Bob Nutting needs to see more. So Chapman with Bednar in that bullpen and some of their other pitchers, Holderman, they have what looks like it could be a very formidable bullpen. They have promising young offensive talent. There's not much doubt about that. I don't love their rotation beyond Mitch Keller. Perez, maybe he bounces back and is good. Marco Gonzalez, fourth or fifth starter at best at this stage of his career. So we'll see where they are. The Chapman signing is interesting because it does signal for them a desire clearly to be more competitive. These other moves to me were sort of fill-in moves for the most part. Obviously they brought McCutcheon back too, that's good. But we have yet to see the Pirates really spend money. And until they do that, I don't know that we'll ever be talking about them as a serious contender. And when you say, well, Ken, they're in Pittsburgh, small market team. Yes, all true. And it's challenging. But we've seen the Reds step out this offseason. We've seen the Royals step out this offseason. It's not impossible. It can be done. Another team, Ken, that won't spend any money, the Miami Marlins. How many free agents have they signed this year? Because I can't think of one. Oh, that's right, because they haven't signed any. <laughs> Didn't they make the playoffs last year? Pretty sure they made, made the, the playoffs, playoffs last, last year. year. They had the manager of the year in the National League, Skip Schumacher, and yet they seemingly are devoting more time and resources to building their infrastructure than they are to the major league team. And what I wrote yesterday is that that's fine. If their infrastructure was a mess, as pretty much everyone in the organization acknowledges it was, you've got to fix that. It doesn't preclude you, though, from fixing and upgrading the major league team as well. And here's a team that talks about the future and wanting to build something long term. Didn't make a qualifying offer to Jorge Soler, so they cost themselves a draft pick. They just are operating curiously, in my opinion. And that's why I wrote what I did yesterday. And a lot of fans say, well, why not pick this team, that team, this team? Yeah, I could get to a lot of teams and probably will. But they stand out because they are the only team that has yet to sign a major league free agent. Even the Oakland A's have signed two free agents. Now, granted, they signed them 
it was Trevor Gott and Osvaldo Beto for a combined $2.25 million. It's not like they're going out on a limb here. But they've done it. And the Marlins are sitting there coming off a year in which you thought they generated some momentum, and they're doing essentially nothing. It's unfair. I lived in Miami for a good chunk of time, and it's a tough city to grab attention in any way. The Marlins are at the bottom of the totem pole. They just don't care about their fan base. And this is not just one ownership group. This is multiple ownership groups. They just are are poison. They're unlucky. So, And I can say that because I live down there, and I'm pissed about it too, Ken. So uh, my question, though, is, is though- yeah. It is difficult to grab the attention of fans there. There's no question. There's a lot to do in Miami and – it's a big city. But at the same time, here you are. You're the Marlins. You've maybe got a chance here. You've maybe got some momentum because you made the playoffs last year for the first time in a full season since the 2003 World Series. And yet, you're not building off that. You're just simply saying, that was fine, but we're not that good. And yes, they had a great record in one-run games. They didn't score a ton of runs. There was some degree of luck involved in their season. But that doesn't mean you concede. And you step back, and yet that's what they're doing. And the way to also grab attention down there is to have some star power, okay? that There was, in this you know recent decade or so, there was no more star power than when Jose Fernandez was on the mound. Obviously had many connections to that city, and they really you know gravitated around him. Not the same example, but Jorge Soler is a legit 40-plus homer guy. He's a Cuban player. There are a lot of people down there that really were starting to be like, hey, I like this guy. This is like our our big power bat. He's still young enough. They don't give him a qualifying offer. This also ties into the article you put out this morning in The Athletic about DHs kind of waiting for phone calls. So just curious why the Marlins would not be entertaining. I, I know the easy answer is they're cheap, but why they wouldn't be entertaining someone like Jorge Soler to build around and why in general he doesn't have a team. I think he's a, he's going to have a huge year just like he did this past season. And I think he's underrated. Of all the DHs that I listed, I would say outside of JD Martinez and maybe Justin Turner, he's the most desirable. And those guys are desirable for slightly different reasons. Justin Turner, because he's such a powerful force in a clubhouse JD, because he's JD and he's still really an accomplished hitter. Jorge Soler though is younger by a good amount than both those guys. He's 32. And I'm with you, Scott. He should be in demand. But I know he's only a DH, and DHs aren't as valued as highly as a player who can do both things. But if I'm the Marlins, I'm staying in touch with him, and I'm saying, okay, you're still lingering out there. What's the price? I don't know that they're doing that. I don't know that they're not. But just because you didn't give him a qualifying offer doesn't mean you still can't sign him. And they can sign him. He'll end up somewhere. He'll probably end up somewhere with a pretty good deal. There are a number of teams I listed in an article that could be looking for DHs, but the Marlins, I would not expect them to sign him. Okay, so I've been wanting to ask you these questions ever since I saw your face today. The Hall of Fame voting is pretty much done, or not pretty much done. It'll be announced, I guess, six o'clock. So everybody should have got their votes in today uh, by the end of the day. I'm excited to see who everybody voted for, the votes that haven't gotten picked. We know you came out and showed your votes like you usually do, right? Right. Yeah, you're not afraid. There's a lot of guys that just don't want to show it. Okay, whatever. Do you think there's going to be some snobs? Do you think, you know, like there's a guy like – I want to talk about Gary Sheffield. He's a guy that, like, is on that border. People, whether they like him or not, in my opinion, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I'll go out there and say that with over 500 home runs. Is there a guy like him where you see him not making the list, you know, just because of percentages reason? Well, I heard AJ at the top of the show, so I'm here to speak for all the biased, despicable, (laughs) irrational, unreasonable, (laughs) idiot writers. He forgot some adjectives. That group. (laughs) So, (laughs) Jeffield, Jeffield is a guy that, if you're going by the Hall of Fame tracker that Ryan Thibodeau puts out there, he's right on the border, and usually Todd when the announcement is made and the actual vote is revealed, the guys come in at less than what they were showing at the tracker. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, that's always the trend. So I do expect him to miss. It's his last year on the ballot. I voted for him. He's an interesting candidate. He's a divisive candidate in many ways. I don't know that the steroid thing, which was really small with him, if anything, holds him back as much as the perception that he was a one-way player. He was a slugger and a Great slugger, all-time slugger, but defensively he didn't do much. And 
that to me is something that probably holds him back. In my view, 509 home runs, the bat waggle, all that supersedes everything else. It's just enough for me. But I can see where some voters don't feel that way. The other guy that I'm looking at that I'm not sure is going to get to 75% is Billy Wagner. And I'm basing this again on where he is with the tracker. He's right above the threshold, but right above might not be good enough because, again, the vote totals or the percentages are going to drop once we get the actual announcement. Billy Wagner, in my view, is a Hall of Famer. And I say this all the time, you've got to consider closers as actual players and judge them accordingly for their position. It's not like there's some subset of baseball animal that we separate. They're real baseball players. And Billy Wagner, I know he only threw a little over 900 innings, but he had an all-time great strikeout rate, an all-time great ERA for his position. And in my view, he should be in. Ken, you mentioned uh, Billy Wagner. He's in his ninth year. Sheffield's in his tenth year. What, what if a guy's a Hall of Famer? He's a Hall of Famer. So why does it take some guys first year guys? Some gears like Perp Lyleven got in what his fifteenth year, his last year on the ballot. What, what's the difference? What what changes in voters' minds? Are they just talked into it after all this time? Are they peer pressured into it? Because if you're a Hall of Famer, you're a Hall of Famer, and you should get in. Now, now for me personally, and I, I'll speak on this, that I feel like. If you're a first ballot Hall of Famer, you're one of the all-time greats. Like Adrian Beltre to me, first ballot Hall of Famer. I look at the rest of that list and I'm like, okay, these guys are probably Hall of Famers, but they shouldn't be first ballot guys because they're not like generational stars. Beltre to me was, you know, look at whatever number for third baseman you want to put out there. He's an all-time great third baseman. So what's the difference between a Hall of Famer and then in the 10th year they become a Hall of Famer? AJ, of all the criticisms the writers get for the vote, this is the fairest. Well deserved. One. Well deserved. This is the this is the <laughs> fairest one because it is curious to a fan, and I'll try to explain some of the rationales here. There are a number of different reasons that go into it. One is simply that the ballot for many years was very crowded, and we're only allowed to vote for ten, so you weren't getting all of the players you want on the ballot in your particular vote. And as players get inducted, as players fall off the ballot, you could add guys. So that's why you will see guys show up in their fifth or sixth years. The steroid era also complicated things. For many years, I didn't vote for Clemens and Bonds. And eventually, I just decided, well, there are guys who we believe use steroids that are in the Hall of Fame. And these guys are alleged to have used it. And that's why I'm going to include them now. And I draw the line with others. But that is also a factor. Another thing, and this is, again, something that I understand a lot of people might not understand. I try to keep an open mind every year and try to take in as much information as I can. And Burt Blylevin, you mentioned him, he's actually a great example. As time has gone on and as the sabermetric movement has taken hold in the sport, we've come to view certain players differently. And Burt Blylevin is one that certainly we developed a greater appreciation for as a voting group as the sabermetric movement basically enlightened us. So that happens too. And then there are situations where over time you just feel differently about a player. And maybe another player gets in and you say, well, if he got in, then I should look about look at this one differently. And then finally, and I know I'm giving a lot of reasons here, social media pressure is a thing. And the pressure also to not be the guy to exclude or the woman to exclude a player if he's that close to the Hall of Fame. You have people who bark at you on social media when you release your ballot, which is fine. That's all part of it. It's deserved in many cases, and it's just part of it. But at the same time, I do believe some voters kind of get queasy about it, and their votes are influenced accordingly. I, I want to ask this one, the last one for the Hall of Famer for me question. Two guys. You see a guy like David Wright. He, he's top five in some numbers as third baseman. Um, you know, he's, he's got a lot of years go to go to get to stay on this ballot. Can you see him moving up uh, as the years go on, depending on what the Hall of Fame ballot looks like? And then a guy like A-Rod, you don't have to dive deep into it, but it's only in his third year. Um, you know, could be a hot subject to talk about. He gets to his sixth, seventh, eighth year. All of a sudden, the, some people change, you know, your mindsets because his numbers were good. You talk about steroids, this and that. Could you see some possibility of those two guys climbing the ranks? David Wright's a really interesting one. And actually, he ties into AJ's question as well. Now, I didn't vote for him this year. 
I do believe he's going to get the 5% necessary to stay on the ballot. And as players with less volume maybe get more consideration, I'm talking about Joe Maurer to some extent, but really guys like Chase Utley, Andrew Jones, some others, guys who don't have the counting numbers, the longevity, then perhaps David Wright you look at it in a different way. And voters start to say, okay, maybe we should be acknowledging players who had these extraordinary peaks in a better way than we have in the past. I can see the case mounting. I don't think his case is quite as strong as Utley's, but it's pretty good. And he's a guy that I didn't think much about until Jason Stark wrote about him in The Athletic a couple of months ago and said, we need to look at this guy. And I would agree with that. A-Rod, I don't know that he's going to get in, ever. And the difference between A-Rod and Manny Ramirez and other players who are alleged to have used steroids, let's use Bonds and Clemens as an example. A-Rod and Manny Ramirez were suspended by baseball for using steroids because they violated a policy that came into effect while they were playing. So after the rules were in effect, after the penalties were in place, these guys still did it. And for me, that's a hard line to cross. I, I have a hard time knowing that they consciously, willingly continued or took steroids, performance-enhancing drugs, and kept going, knowing that the sport officially sanctioned them for it, or was going to officially sanction them for, the, for it if they were caught. That's where I draw my line. Other voters don't draw the line there and say they're fine, everybody is fine, and I vote for all of them. But I remember that time period when A-Rod was fighting, when he was suing everybody, when he was lying. And it's just hard for me to say, okay, I'm going to make him a Hall of Famer when his career, his accomplishments are very much in question. And it's just a tough one for me. I'm 1,000% on the same page on that front. Ken, thank you very much. And also for FT fans, if you want to get more reaction after they make those announcements official and we find out who's in, hit the uh, FT YouTube channel and you'll hear some reactions from AJ and Ken and myself. And then lastly, also Ken's back tomorrow with, should I say who it is? Should I reveal it now? The special guest joining us for like a little Hall of Fame reaction among other things. AJ, you want to announce it? Don't say it. Am I being told don't say it? Oh, oh, go for it? Okay. AJ, why don't you say it? Well, as certain people used to call them in Baltimore, the Twin Towers are joining us tomorrow. <laughs> Ken Rosenthal and Tim Kirchin are going to play a one-on-one -on -one game and also discuss the Hall of Fame ballot. Well, I lose the one-on-one -on -one game, or I lost it many times with Tim. Tim's a great basketball player. Well, guys, I lost listen, I'm coming on tomorrow. Newspapers. I'll be on Tim's with Ken best. tomorrow. We'll have a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to come on. Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah, I think I might. It's going to be good anyway. So for people to see, we'll wrap all that up tomorrow with Tim Kirkland hmm. joining uh, Ken and, and the rest of the FT crew. So Ken, thank you very much. We'll catch you later. Thanks, guys. And also Fair Territory is up there for you on YouTube and wherever you get your pods. As you can see, there's some Hall of Fame conversation, but uh, the Josh Hader signing, the A's planless 2025. Um more on Kershaw, State of Print Media is good stuff in there too on the Sports Illustrated um, madness that went on in the last few days. All right, let's keep the Hall of Fame conversation going for the next yeah. few minutes because then Roger Clemens is going to join us. Just first off, thoughts. When you look at the ballot, you have guys you definitely want to see in, guys that you think are questionable that might get in. Where are you at? I, my, my comment I was going to say, if Sheffield doesn't get in, there's going to be – there's going to be a lot of up. I think there's going to be a lot of uproar if you want really? the truth in in his side because he's been yeah. out there vocally <clears throat> speaking about trying to help himself. He's been talking to us. He's been talking to everybody about you know why he should be on it. Which is listen, if I'm going for something and you're allowed to speak about it, oh, I'm going after a full course. Hey, I did this. I did that. This is what really happened. People are coming out. These reporters said this. This isn't really what happened. And I'm not saying it's going to sway a vote, but it's going to get the truth out there. And you're hearing it from from the piper. You know yeah. what I mean? So his sons come out vocally online, and I love that every second about that. A family member rooting his dad on and everything. And people would be like, oh, man, that's his son, blah, blah, blah. But guess what? That's my dad, man. I'm going to I'm gonna get after it. I want my dad to do what's best for him, and I want him to be happy. So there's a lot of people on his side, and there's a couple people not. So 
this is going to be a really interesting uh, saga that happens tonight. And it could be one of those where it's going to be talked about for a little while afterwards. That's a good call on Chef, who I encourage everyone to listen to. He was on our show and just really laid out his story. So this is his last attempt on the writer's ballot. He's been very vocal. He's been very transparent. And the numbers are there, I think, for most people. I think there's still some people holding him back in terms of the, you know, the Mitch report, PED speculation, et cetera. It's not speculation. He talked about it. And mm -hmm. AJ, it's not court. It's not real court. It's opinion court for each writer and for every fan. I will say I didn't have a lot of facts and information a decade ago, mm -hmm. right? Because I've been in the sport long enough to, you know, be there when he was first on the ballot. So I was like, oh, I don't know. He's one of the, you know, the steroid guys. He came out, laid out his story. For me, I buy it. I understand what he's saying, right? Um, it makes sense to me. And he's transparent, or at least if you believe what he's saying, which I do, he's transparent. There's dudes that are in the freaking Hall of Fame right now who took steroids, who took PEDs, who won't say crap, or they'll say really weird answers. So for me, this one's marked differently. And also in a separate category, like Ken said, from the A-Rods and the Mannies, because those guys actually tested positive when there was that demarcation line of, hey, we're not going to hide this anymore. It's not Bud Selig calling Gary Sheffield into his office and telling him basically to shut the fuck up about the bond situation, which is insane and gives you a lot behind the scenes as to what was going on. So now for me, he's an easy yes. I agree. I didn't know the whole story about Chef until he came on our show and talked about it. So that was, like Todd said, that was great of him to get out there. And maybe he should have done this years ago and told a story. Mm -hmm. Or maybe nobody wanted to hear it. No, I don't yeah. know. But the thing is, is like when you hear him and the way he talked, I mean, listen, I, I, I got to take a guy at his word, right? I, don't, I can't speak on anything differently. And if you watch that interview, you can see that Chef and I had a similar experience uh, with the Balco thing. So, I mean, you know, I was cleared and had no, you know, had nothing to do with it. But he got actually brought in and done the whole thing. But it was one of those crazy things that, you know, I didn't know that story. I didn't know any of that story until – and then the, the Bud Selig story, I didn't know that. So, listen, Jeff, I mean, if you didn't do it, you deserve to be in. And also, we you know, we talked about it with Ken. It's a popularity contest. I talked about this earlier, and, and a lot of people didn't like Chef. They thought he was kind of not – he was mean and, and grumpy. Well, that was his personality. He's a good guy to talk to now. He's fun. Play golf with him a bunch. But, hey – you know, writers have the ultimate power. And if you're not nice to them, 20. Um, have either been on the ballot for a while, like a Todd Helton and haven't gotten in yet, but it looks like he's trending in that direction. Ken mentioned Billy Wagner's close Joe Maurer first time on the ballot. Looks like he probably is going to get in. So thoughts on thoughts on any of those guys, AJ, when you look at the list of who is likely to get their name called of someone you're, you're happy about, or definitely deserves it or vice versa, where it's more controversial in terms of stats, at least. Uh, AB, AB definitely deserves to be in. Um, <laughs> you got to get a lean on, kid. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my camera, but someone All decided. Good. Um, a AB, AB deserves to be in. Adrian Beltre. Here, I'll just move. There Adrian Beltre deserves to be in. I want to get that. There you go. Flex it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's going on, but uh, Adrian Beltre for me, I think Todd Helton deserves. He's waited long enough. Billy Wagner's waited long enough. And, and the, the one for me that's kind of crazy is, is Joe Maurer. I, I mean, he's a tough one for me. I, I love Joe. I played against Joe for my entire career. He replaced me. I just think that, uh, you know, uh, it's tough for me because he really only had like seven years of peak performance. And then people say, oh, he was a catcher. Well, for seven years, it wasn't even really – it was like six years where he played 100 games as catcher or something like that. So if you got to look at his whole – and he doesn't have the counting stats, he's probably going to get in. Well-deserved. Listen, if he gets in, he deserved it. But I, I just don't know that he's a first ballot guy for me. Let me ask you this. Yeah, I, I remember I, when we first talked about it, I brought up Joe Maurer. I thought he should have. Um, 
you you made a great case, great point too as well. But and it's one of those things where we talk about who's who's writing them in, who's writing them out. So that's that's the, the tough that we always. That's the biggest part. You know, was he liked? Of course he was. Was he a good ball player? He was a very good ball player. I think he's on the cusp too as well. But I think about you know I'm thinking and I'm not saying he doesn't deserve, but Todd Helton, he's another guy that. Was he a great ball player? Yes. Deserve to be in Hall of Fame? Some people will say yes. Some people will say no as well, in my opinion. I'm on the cusp too. Look, look at look at Todd Helton's numbers. Yeah. I mean, 133 career OPS plus, crazy. Crazy yeah. good. I don't care course field or not course field. The, uh, played a ton know, of games, gold yeah. gloves, did it all. I mean, listen, Joe Maurer has an MVP. Joe Maurer has gold gloves. Joe Maurer has batting titles, which until then no catcher had ever done. Uh, he has an MVP. I mean, he deserves probably to get in at, at some point. But again, like we've talked about with with Ken, if you're a first ballot Hall of Famer, you are you you stand above by far everyone else. You know, you look at Jeter, Griffey, Mariano, the recent first ballot guys. They were just better. So I, I mean, listen, I'm not saying Joe Maurer wasn't better than me or all the other catchers of the time, but he wasn't so much better that you're like, oh man, he has to go in in the first ballot. Not saying he can't go in next year or the year after. But for me, a first ballot at Hall of Famer is just a special guy. Yeah, and I think two, my two points with Helton that gets him in is that 316 average because he could he can absolutely just rake. And um, I forgot what my next thought was going to be, but yes, it, it was just it was he had a phenomenal career for sure. And I, you know, people are going to be like, "Oh man, you don't think he should be?" And no, I I think he should. I just say that cuss part where you can go either way because some people think you know differently. That's all. You know, everybody has their rightful opinion that they can have. So Billy Wagner, nope. here we go. It's going to be yeah, a the other one. The other one that's been trending a lot, right? It, well, the other one is Andrew Jones. And you look at those numbers that we just had up on the screen. He's he's supposed to be close, but it looks like he's going to be short. But then you look down at the bottom down there, Torrey Hunter. You look at their career numbers. They're 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 pretty similar. Yeah. I know. I mean, Andrew has ten Gold Gloves. Torrey has nine. But Torrey has more RBIs. Andrew has more home runs. Their OPS plus is almost equal. You know, they both, you know, both have whatever. There, there's a million things that you could look at. So why does Andrew Jones get more love than Torrey Hunter? And Torrey Hunter looks like he's going to fall off the ballot this year, right? Where Andrew Jones is ascending. Why? I, I don't know. And no one can explain it to me. So it, it's, it's weird how the voting works. It's a popularity contest. And listen, if you're popular, you got a better chance. It's amazing to see some of the names on there. You go from a guy like Bartolo Colon to, uh, <laughs> Oh, where's Brandon Phillips on there? You know, Matt Holiday, all exceptional careers, you know, but, you know, it's just one of those things where do you see them guys getting the votes? I don't at the end of the day. And that's just, it's an honor just to be on a list like this. And I hope people understand that, Uh, you know, if your name goes on something like this, I mean, I'm framing that thing up. It's going to be right behind your head and we're going to be seeing it from for years to come. It's not going to be in the bathroom. So, uh, that's already know. taken. That's got the, that's got the gold. <laughs> no, but, but no, they send you one. They send you one in the oh, mail. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Okay. So they ready? send you a, a ballot if you're on it. They, they send you one. The BBWA wow. sends you one and says, here's a ballot. We just want you to know that you made the ballot. That's you know, cool. Even if you don't get in, they still send you a ballot to that's prove really to people cool. that you're were, you were pretty good. That's yeah. awesome. <clears throat> yes, I, it is. I'll comment on some of the guys that you, got, that you two were just going over – for me, and I definitely had, you know, Joe Maurer was a big part of my baseball watching experience, right? Like I, I yeah. got to see that whole career front to back. I, I didn't know right off the jump if that was like a lock for me. Mm-hmm. So, and I, and I understand also the other side of it is if you're voting, it's a yes or a no, right? I know, you know, you guys both were kind of asking Ken about that. To me, I decide, I don't care. I, a first ballot's cool. More just means, you know, everyone's kind of consensus on it. But when you are looking at a player, like AJ said, his career doesn't change. It's over, right? And yet there could be like something that happens afterward. If you want to get into the chilling stuff at some point, you know, uh, we're not going to get into it today. Don't have time. But, you know, obviously he changed people's minds and even didn't want to get voted for. But Someone like Joe Maurer, he played it. It's over. So you either, either decide yes or no, especially if you have room on the ballot. The overstuffed ballot part was a legit excuse because you're just working with what you've got. And at one point there was a log jam. But if that's not the case now, he's either in or he's not. But can, me, I, can I just jump on you real quick? Yeah. In my opinion, in life and in what you do every day. Yeah. If it's like, ah, you know, he's on. I say no. If there's any little inkling where you're like in between, in my opinion. And you know what? AJ's might be different than mine. You might be. 
the writers might be. If I'm like, ah, that year, I, I would say no, because I want to be 100% certain that my vote is exactly what I thought. And if I'm like on the cusp, and that's why you see these guys on the cusp don't make it, I think, in my opinion, because if you're not 100% committed to thinking this guy's a Hall of Famer, then guess what? You shouldn't vote for him. And that also is a philosophical thing, though, too, AJ, because there's some people that are big hall. There's some people that are small hall. I feel like I'm kind of in the middle and actually getting more towards big hall because I'm just like, eh, you know, fuck it. Life's short. Let's get some people in here. But for me, I, the one that I wanted to also get to, though, that I was really strong about is I, I just think Billy Wagner's a, a lock for me. I don't understand. I, I had him as soon as he was on the ballot. Like to me, I was like, that is a Hall of Famer. If we're just... Not into relievers, period. Okay. But, I mean, we barely have any closers from this time period that are in the freaking Hall of Fame. I just don't understand what I'm missing. Aside from um, maybe people making the playoff case, I'm like, look at it. He barely pitched in the playoffs. He got, he barely got any opportunities. And he was three for four in his saves. He's got the inflated ERA for one or two blow-up outings. But I'm like, can we look at the whatever it was, 16-year career? I mean, he's got the best, one of the best ERAs ever. He's got the best strikeout per nine if you go by a minimum type of innings. And he obviously played plenty. So I don't know. I, I just don't understand that one. I don't know what I'm missing on that. But hopefully <laughs> like, he gets in. You're passionate about it, bro. Hey. I love that. At least if you're passionate about someone, let them know. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's get <laughs> to our uh, TZ interview segment right now as Roger Clemens joins us right now. And this segment uh, brought to you by TZ, powered by TZ. More information on the back end of the combo. Roger, great to have you back on, man, on obviously a very special day. And I'll kind of lay it out for you. I don't know how much you caught of what we were going over, just some of the kind of either fresh candidates or guys that have a shot to get in this year to the Hall of Fame. Do you have any opinions when you look at the list of guys you feel like definitely belong in there or some that are a little more questionable that might not make it? Yeah, I, I don't even know what what today is. I don't I don't pay attention to it, so uh, <laughs> I, I don't I didn't catch what you guys are leading into. Is today a day they vote on guys or guys get in or what's the deal today? They're getting the announcement today, so the votes are in, and we'll find out who gets in, right? So yeah. that'll be um, at least at the moment it's tracking for Beltre's a lock. Adrian Beltre's first year on the ballot, he's getting in. Joe Mauer looks like he's going to get in in his first year on the ballot. And then we also showed uh, Billy Wagner kind of on the edge there. And that's who I was just referring to. Gary Sheffield's kind of on the edge as well. And this is his last attempt at the ballot. And then also Todd Helton looks like he's going to get in. I mean, for me, I don't know if you caught any of the back end of that. Do you feel like relief pitchers deserve to be in the Hall of Fame if they are, you know, elite status for a long period of time? Because we got to go past Mariano and Trevor Hoffman, don't we? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, you, when you, when you, uh, I just think about, I don't, I don't know their numbers at, at all. I barely know. I barely even paid attention to mine while I was doing it, but the, I, I know the, the person more, the player watching the player and longevity and stuff like that. When you mention those guys' names that I would think that they would have a, have a shot at, at uh, being in there for sure. I want to. I want to ask you this. Besides the Hall of Fame, I'm. I got two kids. I've always wanted to ask you this. Good to see you. First off, um, you, you got you got kids playing baseball that are older, that are going out there trying to do the best of their ability. And for me, I got two young boys coming up. I've always wanted to ask a question to a guy like you, especially being a professional ball player. What is it that you do? Is there something that you you made sure your kids knew and understand as you're growing up, as they're growing up? never to take things seriously, always have fun. Is there something that you always depicted in them? And like, listen, this is the Clemens way. Go out there and be your best. Like, give me a piece of advice for, you know, young athletes out there, especially kids that are going to have to live up to that future name. Yeah, well, Tyler, good, great question. But I, I, you know, they always tell, what's great is they're, they're hitters. I was a pitcher. They said the only thing, dad knew anything about hitting advice, that I was a good bunner, you know? So that's where they got me all the time. But <laughs> man, I coached them up uh, when they were little. I think once they got to high school, you just turned them loose. They 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 were baseball savvy. Um, uh, you know, they they had it down pretty good. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just always tried to keep it fun because I wanted them to realize how hard it was. Um, knowing that they're, you know, I always tease them that uh, my one of my lines, you're going to suck a lot at this game, just suck a little less than the next guy, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, you know, so they they really enjoyed uh, the oldest one played 10 years. He's teaching. I think everything hits home now as they got a little bit older. A few of the things that 
when I took my dad hat off and I put my professional hat on, when they asked me, a, you know, they'd have, you know, we got, we got a bunch of guys, uh, major league or minor league guys throwing right now here in Houston at my place here in Houston. And when they ask me a pointed question, I try to give them a pointed answer. But other than that, I stay out of the way, give them some real good hot points uh, as far as the pitching goes with your shoulder, your chin, you know, your direction that you're doing. Uh, so I still love, I still love messing with them. Uh, but yeah, they, um, I think that, you know, the best thing about the boys is they're, they're doing it. I mean, you, you, you coach them up and then let them, uh, you know, whatever mistakes they make or, 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 or realize how difficult it is. I think you, you, uh, you know, grab them after the game and go over some hot points and then move on. So, um, you know, I worry about right now is the, uh, not mine, but the younger guys. I just gave uh, – I was in Birmingham with Smoltzy and uh, Charles Barkling. We gave uh, – uh, Dr. Andrews retiring, and Doc was making comments on how many – he can't believe how many Tommy John surgeries he's doing on young kids. And we've always encouraged him to set the glove down, maybe play multiple sports, uh, but at least set the glove down, give your arm a little bit of a break. And uh, – so those are, you know, uh, some some of the uh, things that we talk about. When the guys come over here again and get uh, detailed, you know, we'll, we'll we'll correct their grips. I'm talking about 12 year olds to uh, maybe freshmen in college. We'll, you know, regrip the baseball in their hand because it's off, and uh, just remind them that you don't have to throw a hundred. I know all the guys, you know, a lot of guys throw a hundred now. Quite a few of them in the major leagues. But, you know, that's the last thing you need. You need to be able to be a strike thrower and you need some movement and velocity comes in there a little bit later. So uh, but they're doing all these crazy drills. I told them to get back to doing your core work and playing long toss. And, uh, you know, that's how I developed, uh, you know, how how my my speed uh, picked up over the years when I was in college by basically playing long toss, the distance running the core work. So, um, yeah, the youngsters are great. Uh, uh, watching the boys play at the highest level, you know, Cody's with the Phillies. Casey had just retired from the Blue Jay. He's doing some work with Tiza and uh, and some other stuff. He's dabbling in a number of other things and trying to actually get on uh, and may possibly get a PGA Tour card. And uh, Kobe, the oldest one, he he made me Poppy Rocket. I got twin. He's got twin grand uh, boys, seven. So I'm Poppy Rocket now. So they're they're coming next. We're already – throwing them some footballs and they drag me out there to, to throw to them. So we're, we're busy. Rocket, you're talking about, you know, do you know what this, you know what the numbers 100 to 88 means? 100 to 88. Mm -hmm. Not where I finished in a golf tournament, I hope. Yeah, it is. You, I was, I had a hundred points and you had 88 this weekend. Oh, so. oh I was you know on I mean? you then dog. I was on you. <laughs> The question is, how did you bet individually? That's the key. I made some cash Ooh. on the side, dog. Uh, I I got my I got my ass whooped on the side. I think so. I bet on you one day. Weren't you on the betting sheet one day? Yeah, I was on there a couple of days. One day not so good, and one day I I had think I had Lester and I whooped his ass that day. So it was. I think I I big. think I I think I had you that day. Our, our boy Joe Joe Newstreet Joe Joe uh, told me uh, to check it out. Said you were swinging it so. Yeah, I had to go with you that day. So yeah, uh, we, we this talked about this right here. Beat a couple dudes right here. A little chip in piece. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Where were you in the grandstands? You pretty much. <laughs> a little nine iron knock into the hill, and every once in a while they go in where you're looking. I I got pretty lucky on that. I had a couple good chip ins, a couple good long putts, but man, I tell you what, they, that course. First of all, the LPGA girls can flat out hit it. The girls I played with were just awesome to watch. And uh, then I had to beat Baumgartner. I always have a little individual deal going with him, so I had to I had to beat him. But it's four days, so some of these dudes get tired day three, day four. So, but uh, great great fun tournament. My goal was actually to get to a hundred, brother. I was grinding hard, man. That wind kicked up. I I couldn't get there. Yeah, I was well. I was a popsicle on Sunday because I went off so early. So yeah, I, I feel you. I played awful on Sunday, but that's a whole. That's a whole. Nif I'm glad you had a great time. It's one of the great events, yeah. and of course, a baseball player won, right, Jeff McNeil. So that's we're right. proud of him. But I, I, I have to ask you. I have to ask you this. I mean, I look at your numbers. I obviously faced you many times, and I know it's Hall of Fame Day, and I know we talked about this a little bit earlier last time I had you on. But seriously, how how the fuck are you not in the Hall of Fame? 
Well, first of all, if I knew it was Hall of Fame Day, I probably wouldn't have come on with y'all. Because- <laughs> 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 That tells you how much I pay attention to it. So it was in our rearview mirror 10 years ago. Like, like I said, when – who was it? Uh, my teammate in Boston, Jimmy Rice, he got voted in on year 10. And I called him to congratulate him. But I also said, how did you get better in 10 years? Did you go play That's semi football question. and hit another 100 homers or something somewhere? I mean, come on. He should have been in on the first one. Either, either you're in or you're not. So – uh, again, like you guys know, I, I don't know if you guys read my statement way back when that that stuff was in my rearview mirror. The Hall of Fame is not going to change my life one way or the other. Uh, it, it wasn't a reason why I played, as you guys know. I played because I loved the game. I, in the first couple of years, I busted my butt because I knew I was going to change the landscape of my family, my mom, my sisters. Uh, we came from just about nothing. Um and I was going to change that. Then after that, it was back to like at the University of Texas when we won the national championship, beat Alabama. It was about winning championships. Once I got my feet, um, you know, firmly in the ground and realized, hey, I, I can play with these guys. And this is, is going to be a, a great living. But I, but again, I was my pops died when I was nine. I was raised by t- two strong willed women, my mother and my grandmother. My granny always said, hey, if you're going to be a ditch digger, be the best damn ditch digger in the country. So. That's why I get a little offended when people mention or you're out somewhere and somebody, hey, you silver spoon, you know, athletes, you know, that I said, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I, 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 if you're going to mouth off, understand what, what you're mouthing off about. I mean, uh, like my high school coach, the good thing we want to live three miles from my high school because I didn't have a car. I threw my backpack on. I ran uh, home after school or when we had practices on the weekend. My mom worked three jobs. She was an accountant by day. Uh I helped her stock coolers in the afternoon and we cleaned office building at night for a little extra money so I could have a badass red glove and a sweet pair of new cleats. So that, you know, those those kind of things are what uh, our foundation is and, and the people we come from. So, um, you know, that's those are the things my teammates, you guys, the guys I played against. Um, you know, like you said, you guys know, you know, most of you guys know me off the field. I like to have fun, do a little DJing, of course. And uh <laughs> uh, on the on the field, man, it was it was game on. I, I don't, you know, I faced some of my teammates from college, and I know they wanted to hit one back off my kneecap, and I wanted to punch them out. So that's just good competition. I'll take you to dinner later. Let me ask you this: uh, This would be my last question for the Hall of Fame because I've had this ongoing question for a lot of years now since playing with Cincinnati, uh, getting to know the guy Pete Rose. I mean, this is you know, it's it's, it's it goes with everything. I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. It's one of those things where I feel like once he passes away, then eventually they might do something. But do you think he should be in the Hall of Fame right now? Yeah, don't do it after he passes away. Either do it. You know, that's ridiculous. Do that. Let him yeah. enjoy it. I mean, it was similar to when I, you know, when you say that, it's when I was in London and I went and saw Tina Turner play, and it was unbelievable. And I was asking everybody because Tina Turner just passed away a couple of weeks before that. And I said, please tell me that she was able – to get over here and see this unbelievable show you guys did of her life. And they said, absolutely. She came like three times before she passed. So same thing with Pete. Pete should be in I, with all the, well, you can get betting on your phone now in the dugout. Exactly. Probably. You can it on the iPad in the, in the dugouts. Now the way there's, there's, there's betting on if the sun's going to come up or not. So Pete was a great player. And, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, no, it's, that's, that's, that's obvious. Hey, Roger, I got some fan questions for you. So Dave said, can you ask Roger his opinion of the way that Yamamoto trains? Now, obviously, you know, you got a lot going on in your life, so I don't know if you know how he trains. It's in a very unique way, but, you know, the Dodgers big signing Yamamoto has a very unique javelin-like process that he uses. And you can stop me. I can help you out a little bit here on on what he does because he's all about flexibility, repeatable delivery. He's 5'9". Um, I think he's like what hundred. Well, he's listed like one seventy. He's more like one one fifty ish, I would say. But he just yeah. signed the biggest free agent pitching contract of all time. So, Crazy. do you know about his training? Have you seen anything? So, I have seen some videos on him. We I uh, was on a show uh, a couple weeks ago, and we visited about him and Otani coming back from his second Tommy John as a hitter. AJ, you guys you, and Todd, you guys will know. Um, but I yeah I thought the guy was five ten. His split is a is like a change change up split. Way back when on Team USA, I went over to the 
uh, Team USA. I pitched in the Tokyo Dome. And uh, two days before, we had a couple of practices, and my agents had set up. There was about 13 uh, well-known Japanese pitchers that came over. They wanted to see how I held the split finger and, and how to throw it properly. It was hard to teach a lot of them. They have smaller hands, so they kept shoving the baseball back in the very back of their hand. It became a fork ball. The other guys were hooking a seam. And when you hook a seam and throw your split or your fork, whatever you call it, when it comes out and when you hook a seam, it knuckles a little bit. And the hitters, you hitters are able to read that. And talking to Pujols and different guys like that, they're able to uh, they're able to see something. Contreras with the Yankees, he hooked it. And it pulled, it tugs a little more. There's obviously more friction, and it pulls at your, your elbow ligaments. So you got to be careful with that. Same thing when I talked about Otani, not getting off the subject here, but Otani, I'm going to be interested to see how he swings because – and talking to hitters that have had Tommy John, when they put their uh, pinky on the uh, knob, instead of having to almost choke up maybe a half inch, there's some stuff going on too there when you swing and miss. So that's going to be interesting to see. But, uh, yeah, going all the way back, he's got a split change. Um, he's good He's good uh, north and south, which is where the strike zone is now. Uh, they pinch you east and west. Uh the other thing is, and they said, you know, what I heard is not going to be a problem because I guess he's practiced with it. But the MLB ball is bigger than the Japanese baseball. Uh, I know that to be the fact. I do my work with the Astros when Mr. Crane and I flew out. Uh, I think it was Tanaka. We went out to L.A. They, you could hear a pin drop when I gave him uh, a signed Major League Baseball. And I said, you understand this ball is bigger than the one you've been throwing. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. And uh so it's going to it'll be it'll be inter interesting to see. I'll watch the guys. I mean, you can't you know, like Maddox said, they you know, Greg Doggy told me at uh, Tahoe, he said the contracts are given out now, they couldn't afford us. And and so you can't really, <laughs> I mean, it, seems like, it seems like the going rate right now. I mean, so who who knows? And they're going to have to lower the uh I mean, a quality start's going to be four innings and probably five or six runs. Uh, the, the only way to combat that with all the new rule changes is to tie your DH, you know, tie your DH to the starter. So that'll force a starter to go six innings. So when you get to the seventh inning, all bets are off. You, you can pull your starter, but, you know, you're going to have a manager come up and say, hey, I need you to go more than three innings tonight or we're going to lose our DH. So, you know, that that's one thing with all these other rule changes that they have. And while we're on that subject, on, on, a, on a good note, I always tease everybody, quit referring to the foul pole as a foul pole. If you hit it, it's a fair pole. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good. I'm, I might use that hey, one for sure. It, it, it falls in the same category, boys, as why, why is there an expiration date on sour cream? Makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, why do you what? park in a, in a, in a why, why, why do you park yeah. in a driveway and drive on a parkway there let's go, go. come on i'm here all day that. if you guys need me hey, <laughs> another fan question from a guy named william who's your favorite pitcher right now to watch besides those two that we just talked about is there a guy that's like yeah i'm gonna sit here and watch this guy pitch these six or four or five or six innings <laughs> four or yeah. five or six i like yeah I like, I, you know, I, again, uh, you know, I love, you know, here at home watching the guys a little bit older, you know, Verlander, Searcher, uh, uh, Garrett Cole. I, I love watching these guys go out and try and eat innings. Um, there are some young ones out there that uh, are up and coming. But, uh, you know, again, like you said, you just try and encourage them. I can tell you a funny story. I'll tell you a story about when I was in the locker room in Houston during the game. The guy come up, I was talking to some of the uh, – the uh, the IT boys, the propeller heads, I call them, trying to tell them that, hey, we need an eye and a heart test every once in a while. You just can't punch this guy's name and numbers in a computer and let it spit it out at you. Do a little eye and a heart test. The guy threw really good. I'm not going to mention the name. Threw really good. He pitched five innings, two runs, came up, looked exhausted, kind of gave him a head nod because I was watching the game. He took his jersey off, threw it in the floor in the wet bag, in the laundry bag. And I told the guys I was talking to, hold on a minute. I go, what are you doing? He goes, oh, Mr. Clemens, I'm done. I'm done. I go, I know you're done. I said, but you want five innings. There's no way that damn jersey could be dirty. Just pick it up and hang it back <laughs> in the locker for the next start. Oh, God. <laughs> he started to do it. I said I was kidding, but I, I wasn't. <laughs> That's good. <coughs> I like that. Rocket. Um, yeah, go ahead, AJ. 
No, I was going to ask him, uh, have you seen anything? I know you said you don't pay attention a whole lot. Have you seen what the Red Sox have been doing and uh, their ownership group saying that they don't have to spend to win and how they're going to cut payroll again but raise ticket prices probably? I haven't seen it, brother. I, I, I will go up there. I do quite a bit for the Jimmy Fund and my foundation. But, uh, yeah, no, I haven't been paying attention to, to – uh, you know, just a few things have been going on this winter. So I'll, I'll start diving in a little bit more. I'll hit uh, two or three spring training spots, visit with some young kids and give them a little new Rockney speech and do that. But you're, what are you saying? They're, they're going to, they're going to uh, still rebuild right now. I guess. I mean, they just said, well, they said one of the off season say we're going full throttle and they trade Chris sale <laughs> and they don't really sign anybody. I mean, Lucas Giolito is a nice pickup, but, they yeah. haven't signed anybody. We know all the Yankees are getting Soto and trying to get Blake Snell and all these guys. And the, yes. the, now the Red Sox, Sam Kennedy's like, hey, uh, yeah, we're going to tone back the payroll this year. So, I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense. What does uh, 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 Snell oh, – We lost him for a sec. Was he saying Snell? Yeah, I think he was about to say, what is Snell going or what's he getting? <laughs> well, to quote the famous – a uh, line from Sam Ken- Kennedy over the weekend. Whatever it is, not enough. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> they're not going to offer enough. We know that. I'm sure they're in on him, but they're in on every big player. Uh, we'll try and see if we can get Roger back on the back end there. He was losing some Wi-Fi. Yeah, like we said um, before, oh, we we were in on that guy. We were in on this guy. We- I will say this. I mean, for a guy, obviously, that has you know strong history with the Red Sox, AJ, it is better at this current time period if you don't pay that close of attention to what they're doing and also what they're saying it's actually <laughs> much better for your health. That's why he looks so good. Many people were like, damn, Roger's like Benjamin Button right now. He looks great. Yeah, he does. I said, yeah, he's got a good skincare routine. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see if we can get him back. Well, Otherwise, obviously, good, had, good stuff from Roger. I had one more. I, I, you question, had one more for him? But if we get to it, that would be great. Yeah. Well, he might be coming back on sooner than we think. Oh, he's coming oh, there back. There he goes. There he is. Go ahead. What did All you right, have? So, we got some I, big I a, range. We got some big range down here, boys. So bear with us. No, nah, no worries. <laughs> I, I want to talk about something as simple as this. You know, you play against guys like Boggs, Tony Gwynn, um, some dominant, dominant hitters. Now you think of guys nowadays like the Aaron Judges, Carlos Stanton's, um, you know, Freddie Freeman's. Is there from when you played to now, would there be a different way you pitch somebody? Like knowing the power that these guys consist of, or would you you wouldn't change anything in your approach? I would like to just dabble on that a little bit. Would there be a different approach for you? You say, you know what? Here's my stuff. You can hit it. Go ahead. But if not, let's go. No, oh, he froze on us again. Oh man, that's I, I wanted to hear what it, what his you know what kind of approach you would have against yeah, these guys. Of course, I, I think that would be interesting to hear. We'll try one more time, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, see if we can get him before we get to Aloy Jimenez, by the way. Some people in the chat right now asking about Blake Snell. Yeah, he's still a free agent. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Confirmed. Nobody's hey, I'm changed. not gonna complain. We yeah. We we've we've gotten a couple uh oh, he's back. Couple signings back, in the last twenty four hours. Me? All right, here, let's do it. Let's try it. Last one. Did you did you get anything I said there? <laughs> He said, yeah, it was a great question, Todd. (laughs) He said, yeah. No, I'm done. I don't want to talk about that crap. He said, I'm done. That's a wrap. (laughs) We did our best. We did our best. We can send Roger text and do a little makeup time at some point. Oh, he said there's big storms going on down there right now. So that's fair. All right. Oh, well. We've been there. Um, Aloy Jimenez is going to join us in a couple minutes. And a reminder to use the discount code FOUL, F-O-U-L, for 20% off your first order at teasaenergy.com. If you're out there and you like dip and you shouldn't and you should try and get off of it, uh, <laughs> tobacco-free, nicotine-free, Teza is the spot. Check it out. Learn more information at teasaenergy.com. Okay, before we get to Aloy Jimenez, thoughts on the White Sox offseason thus far? Um, Todd Father, they have actually been very active. They've changed up their roster quite a bit. It's just not necessarily a talent boost, as mm-hmm. we've joked. AJ, what team do the White Sox resemble the most right now? 
Mm. Eric Kratz's favorite team, the Royals. <laughs> the Kansas City oh. Royals. I will give them credit because we've talked about this. You, you can't – is this fair? You can't criticize a team for trying to make a culture and a character change and then also say, well, you're not – bringing in enough talent because i mean sure it'd be great to have every player in the freaking clubhouse be you know an elite ball player and an elite human but can you yeah. speak to the fact <laughs> that there's some people you play with where you're like that dude's amazing but if we have 25 of him everyone would just be slugging each other in the face all day <laughs> I, I guess it's uh first off that's aj's second favorite team we got to make sure we say that the royals but, no the white Sox. before we bring up the white Sox anymore Who's the who's his first? The Cubs. Of oh, the Cubbies. <laughs> no doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Also, I've always been confused as a Cubs fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, it, I mean, listen, I love what the Royals have been doing, man. They they came out and they slugged in the beginning, and there we talked about it. We talked about Lugo, the signings that they that they made, and it's not gonna blow you, not gonna blow you away, but it's at the same time they're doing stuff, and it's not just one guy; it's four or five different guys. They're going to come in that are proven that could come in and do damage. And I'm I'm happy for those guys, man. I'm happy for the Royals. The White Sox, I mean, they're doing what they said pretty much. They're trying to do something different. So. Yeah, they are definitely doing doing something different. There's turnover. So one guy that's still there, though, thankfully, and joining us right now is Aloy Jimenez back on FT Live. Aloy, how you doing, man? Happy offseason. How's it been going for you? Uh-oh. We got we got a little guns out. Did you just get a workout in? I'm looking for those, <laughs> for those sleeves. AJ, you see those sleeves? So first off, we love the the hoodie sleeveless. Are you coming off a workout? And how is the off season going for you thus far? It's been good, and I going to work out now. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got today? Give us the play by play of what you'll do for the rest of the day. Well, uh, warm up, gym. Um, uh, take some fly balls, hit, uh, and run. That's it. Hey, so like, be specific now. You're in the gym. What kind of, what are we working? We're working on legs, arms, core. In the gym, what kind of, what are we working? We're working on legs, arms, core. What do we got? Trainer on your own. Well, today, uh, I got legs and core, so. Oof. All right, all right. What are we? What are we eating in between? What are we eating in between now? What are we eating before and after? Are we going hard? Are we going a little protein shake? Uh, just protein shake before and then uh, two bananas after. Uh, so we're not going. We're not going pollo guisado after. Uh, maybe, maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's you clearly crazy. aren't in Chicago if you're wearing that outfit. You got to be in Florida somewhere because Chicago it's way too cold for you to be going sleeveless. Uh, well, I'm in Dominican right now, so it's really hot here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's no way you're walking around Chicago with that cut off shirt right now, because nah. man, you'd be getting some frostbite on those guns. <laughs> it's, it's minus what? Minus fifty? Close enough. I don't know what it is, but it's cold there. <laughs> it's pretty damn cold. <laughs> hey, I want to ask you about Martin Mald uh, Maldonado a little bit. I played against him. I know uh, how big of a guy he is. I know how good of a catcher he is. Talk about pretty much how he's going to help this squad and solidify your pitching staff here a little bit during the season. Well, you guys know him. He know how to catch. He know how to call the games. Uh, that's That was good. Uh that we got him. Um, I hope uh, he come with us and help us. Um, and you know, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun. Eloy, as a White Sox yeah. fan, obviously you know I'm a White Sox fan. I come in there and see you guys and root for your guys every time. Give me some hope this year. Give me some hope to why you guys can compete with in the AL Central and hopefully get back to the postseason. We're gonna be. We're gonna be. Last year it was. Uh, terrible season, uh, but we're going to come at it, uh, you know. Uh, we asked some couple guys, and um, this group is good. We just uh, had to figure out what's going on, and then we're going to move forward. You're going to hit 40 for me this year? If I'm healthy, more than that. More than that. Hell more yeah. Than that. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Hey, Give me Eloy. a number. Eloy, who was the last guy to hit 40 home runs for the White Sox? 
You. <laughs> yeah, the baby. Yeah, there you go. Hey, Let's I know. Go. Hey, listen, that's a goal right there. What number? what number? 40 on the dot. 40 on the dot. Okay. He knows. What do you got? He knows. Aloy, if you're healthy for a full season, what do you got for us? You know, uh, I don't want to say it. I just want to do it, you know. Uh, you okay. Don't, wanna... don't talk. Oh, don't oh, talk about it. Yeah. about it. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really like talk guy. I just like to do it. Uh, you know what? I think you're going to get 39 and a half. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Just short of that top, Father. Hey, what do you think of the moves that have been made so far? I know, you know, AJ started to talk to you about it this offseason by the White Sox. There's been a lot of players coming in, going out, and it's technically now a new front office, right? Chris Getz is the general manager there. Ken Williams was there forever. So was Rick Hahn. They are gone. Those are guys that you knew pretty well, right? They, they signed you. You were only really under their watch for a long time. So what do you think do you of the think change that's going on? And have you gotten any word about how things could be differently for the White Sox, how things could roll differently for them this coming season? You know, uh, this is a business. Uh, guys, I see guys come and go, uh, come and stay. Uh, uh, you know, this uh, new stuff is uh, it's coming with something new, like they say. Um, and I, I've been like it, you know. Uh, it's been good. Uh, I hope we sign a couple more guys to add to the lineup, but... If they're not, we're going to battle with what we have. In your mind, what do you think needs to change this coming season from a team perspective? What, what, what do you think has to happen that didn't happen last year? And that can go across the board. That can be something from, you know, pitching defense, offense, leadership, communication, et cetera. What are, what are parts from your reflection on the offseason here, thinking back to the season of – what went wrong? Uh, I, I think pretty much it's been together. You know, sometimes uh, we try to be heroes uh, by ourselves, uh, and this is a team game. You know, if no, just one guy can do everything. So except for Tani, he can do everything at the same time, but. <laughs> That's that's pretty much what happened last year. We tried to be a hero, and everybody was like, um, "Let's focus on what we need to do." Um, but this year is gonna be different. Well, Eloy, what's gonna change this year? You got a whole new, almost a whole new coaching staff, especially on the offensive side. Uh, you know, Nachi, Jose Castro's gone. Chris Johnson's gone. Uh, new first base coach, new third base coach. I think no, I'm sorry, not new first base coach and Jason Bourgeois. So what do you think is going to change from your side and how they talk to you hitters? Well, let's see, because I I, I talked to Marcus, but it's not the same, uh, like, face-to-face -face and being, like, on the phone, you know. Uh, so let's see what's going to be, uh, how it's going to be, and I hope it's going to be good. What what is what what does Marcus say when you talk to him? What what was his what's his message, right? What's his thing that he says? All right, all, I need all of our hitters to do this to be successful as a White Sox. Oh, he just talking about well to me. He just uh, called me to know uh, to know me to see how how I feel. What I, what are you gonna work? What I need to work? Uh, and I like it. You know, um, it, it was good. My last thing on this topic, so we talk about the change and everything else. Who's the guy you're going to be leaning on? Who's the leader right now in that clubhouse? I mean, it might even be you. Like, who's that guy that everybody's like, all right, well, we got to lean on this guy for this year and uh, and work our way through? Well, uh, you know, in, uh, in the clubhouse, it's, just, it's not just one leader. Uh, it's it's got to be everybody, but uh, – we're going to talk about it. We've been talking, so um, we're going to figure it out. I don't know exactly right now, but we're going to see. Have you, uh, my next question, have you been keeping up with the Hall of Fame watch? We know Adrian Beltran, a Dominican-born player, 
is hundred percent pretty much getting in the Hall of Fame. You want to you want to talk about him a little bit, and uh, has he ever helped you, or you talked to him about baseball along the way? Well, uh, I saw him uh, just outside uh, of the field one time, and um, he gave me good advice, like just keep working hard, uh, be humble, and uh, you know everything's gonna be there if you work hard. Uh, and that's good, you know, when, when someone has so much successful and they tell you some things like that, that's helped you a lot. And especially when you jump, that you still figure out what you want to do. Hey, w- which famous players from your home country have been most helpful to you? Have you been able to spend some time with any guys? Obviously, we're talking about Beltre, but any others that have made a really big impact in your life or in your career or both? Well, uh, I talked with Pujols uh, a couple times. Uh, he helped me. Uh, I talked with uh, Davey one time, and uh, he was pretty much good. He helped me a lot. Uh, and I spent, like, my first year uh, with the Cubs, uh, I spent uh, pretty much half of the extended league. Uh, with Manny, and he helped me a lot. Oh, Manny Ramirez, right? Back when he was with yeah. the Cubbies? Yeah. When he was, like, player coach, something like that. Yeah. Uh, he, he in the minor uh, leagues, right? Leagues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was my first year in uh, in the uh, United States, and uh, he he helped me a lot. He, he showed me how to have a one routine, he showed me how to work on teams, and uh, it was good. I have a, a great experience with him. So Eli, I remember oh, – go ahead, AJ. No, I was going to ask. Eli, you know, you mentioned David Ortiz. You mentioned Manny Ramirez. You mentioned Pujols. Who was your guy growing up in the Dominican? Because there's been a ton of great players that have come through the well, Dominican, clearly. Well, those three guys, uh, that was – when I was a kid, I, I watched – those three guys, but my favorite favorite is not from here. Uh, is Miguel Cabrera, and now I'm always say it because he's he's been a great hitter. He's been amazing, uh, and uh, he really helped me too. You know, and that's uh, pretty much. Uh, I I want to say my hero growing up because I saw him like as a role model and. And I, I play against him, and it was like, oh, unbelievable! I'm here with my favorite player, and that was good. I want to take you back to your Manny Ramirez part for a sec. So, when he was player coach, right, in the minor leagues, where he was kind of serving multiple roles there, it really took some young players under his wing. I remember I spoke to him. It was probably that year or around that time period because it wasn't for very long. And I said, how are you teaching them? Everyone's talking about you and saying, you know, you're the guy they're turning to who's really helping them mature and develop on and off the field. And he goes, I'm telling them all the shit that I did wrong. <laughs> and then saying, don't do that. <laughs> so was that part of the approach? Well, it was like <laughs> – he was nice. He's a little bit crazy, but he, he's nice. <laughs> uh, he always tell us, uh, be early, be on time. <laughs> that I think he, he, he wasn't like really good when he played. That's why he tell us, you know, uh, have a routine that is the most important thing and, uh, be disciplined. Uh, that was, the other thing that he showed me a lot. That was really good for him. In your mind, how important is it to have coaches that are bilingual? Well, it's it's good, you know, because not everybody is comfortable speaking English. Uh, I'm like, I don't I don't mind because I speak English, but you know, for other guys who doesn't speak English. That is pretty much good because they're gonna feel more comfortable and they're gonna understand really what they say. Do you have that role yet? 
Do you have guys yeah. like when you're now back home coming up to you and saying, hey, you know, teach me how I can get to, to where you're at or, hey, can I go work out with you? Like right now, I know, you know, in a few minutes after this, you're going to go work out and then hit the field too. Do you go with a group or do you like to kind of train on your own or just with a trainer? No, we, we had a group. Uh, we had a couple guys uh, that I trained with uh, that are my friend. Uh, they play uh, two play for Texas. Uh, one uh, is a free agent right now, and uh, and uh, Brian De La Cruz. He played for the Marlins. Uh, we all play. Uh, we all practice together. So it's it's been good. They they ask me questions. I answer. I ask them questions, and the answer is been good. Uh, we got a group, uh, a good group that I like uh, be with. Do you guys go to like a local field and hit? Can I come? Can I show up as a fan and watch you guys bang <laughs> BP or what? Maybe get in there and throw some BP. I'll take some hacks with you guys. Yeah, you can come. Yeah, you can come. <laughs> <laughs> do, I have to, do I have to shag or can I just hit? You you can do whatever, whatever you like. Okay, all right. I'm just checking. Have you heard? Eli, have you heard any of the trade rumors about yourself, Dylan Cease, uh, some of the other guys on the White Sox? And does it affect you at all? You've already been traded once from, obviously, the Cubs to the White Sox. But some players, they affect. Some players, they don't. So have you heard any of the trade rumors? I hear about it. Uh, but that was, like, in November. But right now, I don't hear anything about it. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a business. Uh, I come from from a trade a uh, long time ago, and uh, it's a trade me. I understand. Uh, I don't like I don't buy the idea, but if they train me, I know it's because uh, they need something, and the other team need, need me. So. Oh, okay. So when you got traded from the Cubs to the White Sox, right? Everyone was super excited. All you've done since then is absolutely. <laughs> crush the Cubs. So as long as you continue to do that, Eloy, <laughs> and as long as you're on the White Sox while you do it, we'll always be friends. Be friends. Yeah, yeah. I, li I like to play against them, you know. <laughs> good. Yeah, That's to, good. Um, to, to remind them uh, something. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, remind them what they're missing. That's what you remind them of. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, I'll, I'll follow on that. So, you know, some guys get traded – and they're just super pissed always, right? They, they caught me by surprise, and I'm going to bring it to them. The other side is, like, like you're doing maybe, is smiling, just being like, hey, I'm just going to have a good time with it. That, and for you, obviously, you were you know, a, a minor league prospect, so it's, it's a little bit different. But is that how you feel with the Cubs? Like, is, it, is it something where you're like, hey, I'm going to show them? Or more like, hey, thanks for getting me somewhere else, giving me an opportunity with the White Sox? getting a nice contract, getting to play, getting to show who I am power-wise and everything else in the big leagues? Well, uh, at the beginning when they trade me, I was like, they're going to find out who I am. They're going to find out who I am. That's all they t uh, I told myself. But after that i growing, um, I'm just like play uh, against them. I just enjoy it, you know. And especially I have friends over I still still play there. So I'm always uh talk trash to them and uh and they talk <laughs> trash to me and, that, and that's good and I like it, you know. A question for you, one of the big like player related topics this week. So Anthony Rendon was on a show and said he thinks that the season should be shorter. Some of the fans wanted to get your thoughts because AJ and Todd yesterday, as former players, both said, nah, I'm good. 162, I get it. How do you feel about the length of the season and anything that you would do to kind of tweak it, if at all? Well, I'm, I'm good with 162, you know. Uh, I'm just not... No, I agree with uh, nine any double hitters, you know. <laughs> 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 all, all day over there, but I'm good with 162. Let me ask you this. You're a guy that's going to work out. My question to you is, has there been any thought of you, you know, Ronald Cunha goes back to his country and plays uh, 
they call it winter ball. You know what I mean? Even though it's warm, have you thought about doing something like that at all? Or are you just like, you know what? I want to stay healthy. I want to train and get bigger and stronger. Uh, you know, I like to play winter ball and, uh, I thought about it, but with all the problems that I had in the past, uh, it's hard to me to make that decision sometimes. Uh, I just want to be like work out uh, really good um, to feel confidence uh, to start the season and finish the season. You know, like I want to, like I want to be. I want to play a full season. So sometimes uh, you playing you playing winter ball. That's the time, and uh, you know work out like you supposed to sometimes, you know. So might be next year, might be two years. Who knows? But I, I like to play here. Is there pressure to play? Because obviously you have family and friends and just knowing the teams probably and everyone involved with winter ball. Like do you get calls and texts and have to communicate with them, hey listen, I'll I'll do it eventually. Yes. Yes. Uh couple times yes uh especially for my family they ask me a lot hey when are you gonna play when when it's gonna be when i want to see you play and uh, i just tell them um soon soon because i don't want to tell them i'm not gonna play but uh sometimes uh it's it's a little bit hard to say <laughs> to say no because uh pretty much my family uh, they don't have visa to come to the United States, so they rather watch me play here. <laughs> so, well, I, I already tell them that I, I need to work out, and they understand. But it's just it, it's a little bit pressure sometimes. All right, what's your team down there? What, what's your team in Dominican? Who, who do you play for? Escogido. Oh, okay. Did they need you this Crazy. year? Could they use you this year? They they call me, but like I say, I, I have to work out first. And then if I feel that I, that I have to play, I play. But this year, is, it's, it's going to be uh, – it, it will be good. So I have to work out first and play. 40 homers this year. We're counting on you. 40. <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have a question, though, on what you said with some fam and friends that unfortunately can't get over to watch you because of visa issues. How tough is that for them to not be able to see you in person? I'm, I'm sure they can catch you on TV and clips online and everything else. But how difficult is it for them to not be able to see you in person? And is, is there you know, any way that you um, actively are trying to get some of them to be able to at least get over for a little bit of time to watch you for some games. You know, every year in the big leagues, right? We always show those clips when it's like so-and-so's parents for the first time get to come over and watch them play. And, you know, it's some of the great stories that we get every year in baseball. Well, it's, it's a little bit hard. Uh, sometimes uh, my family, they, they ask me, uh, how we can uh, work on the visa and all that, but I can, like sometimes I can help them. Uh, but uh, that's why I like to play here because uh, so I show them that I that I care about them and you know. Uh, but sometimes it's it's a little bit hard. Here's a fun one for you. Career stats for you. Zero stolen bases. What? Hey, so forget about the home runs. I don't even want you to get 40. I don't want you touching 40. <laughs> I need I need one stolen base this year out of you, man. Can you promise me a stolen base? Yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will. That had to be a, a combo, right? Have, have you joked around about it or have any teammates given you shit for it? And you go up to a coach like, yo, give me the green light one time. Like, you got to find someone who, who, who's like the slowest to the plate right now in the big. Well, he's, he's got to get it where it's first and third. He's on first and they don't even throw to second base so he can get the easy. Like double steal action? Yeah. I no, had not a, even that. 
I had a one of ten last year in Atlanta in a bong swing, and and that was the only attempt that I had. <laughs> but I, I talked to Pedro a lot, uh, uh, our skip, and uh, he said, no, nah, he doubles and homers, and that's it. <laughs> love it. You got a sneak it. attack. Just sneak attack them one time. As long as you make it, Pedro's not going to say anything. Just to make it. You got to make sure you make it. Yeah, I right. Will. Just be on. You know, D, you know the problem was you had Daryl Boston at first. He's always telling you don't oh, go. Man. New first base coach Jason Bourgeois. He's gonna be like, go, go. He's gonna be in your ears and be like, hey, this guy's one point twelve, one point nine to the plate. You can get him. Go, just go, just go, go. <laughs> and when he says go, don't be scared. Just go. Okay, at least one this year. At least one. Yes, yes. I need one. Thank you. Know, you. Yes, thank we will. You. We will have after. a party for you. Forty we'll hammers bring him on and one right after. Bay. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll do a toast right after the whole deal. Well, it was great to see you. You know, we hadn't seen you this off season. It was great to catch up with you. Go crush a workout right now, and uh, we'll see you in spring training. Yeah, there you go. Hey, let's go. Let's see it. Let's see it. Let's All go. Right. All right. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. See you. Cheers. See you soon, Eli. Happy New Year. See you. Happy New oh, Year. AJ. Wait, what? Oh, oh, oh wait, what? shit. Merry Sorry. Christmas, Eloy. It, it, uh, it just came out. Happy, hey. Halloween, happy Halloween. So, you, Todd, you'll love this story. One t- so when I was doing fan stuff for the White Sox, uh, it was like a couple years ago now, they take you around to like suites to meet people. Mm-hmm. And they took me into the suite, and it was like these random people. And they all had Eloy Jimenez jerseys on. I'm like, hey, nice to meet you. And they introduced you, you know, who you are. And then we walk out. And the lady goes, oops, sorry, that was the wrong suite. We're on the wrong floor. Those were Eli's, Eloy's family, his parents, and everybody. I was like, oh, wow, oh, that's amazing. They're probably looking at me like, who the hell is that guy? Yeah. <laughs> Why do they keep bringing me these weird-looking dudes? So oh, was, yeah. They're like, oh, sorry, you were in the wrong suite. We messed up. <laughs> they were great. They were awesome, though. They were great uh, people. They were smiling. They were happy as could be. Oh, that's but great. It was just funny <laughs> that it was his parents. They're probably uh, like, yeah, I, I yeah. ordered a burger and fries. I, I didn't order a <laughs> World Series winning catcher, yeah, but no. sure, yeah. okay, come on Luckily, down. there was a picture of me on the wall, and I was like, that's me over there. In case you didn't know, that's me, the little one. <laughs> Can't you tell him. That's I'm not a rando. Uh, All right, so being that we had Aloy, let's do our bet MGM World Series odds. The Chicago White Sox entered the season with mid-expectations, and they did not live no. up to those mid-expectations, right? Not at I mean, all. I think – there were some people like, yeah, this could be like a 500-ish team, maybe mess around in contention in the AL Central. And by midseason, they were a total mess. Um, they did not perform well. There was plenty of crap going on off the field, too. And they went from plus 3,500 to put a hundo down. And if they win the World Series, you win 25 Gs. Yeah. They ain't winning. And, of course, didn't <laughs> make the playoffs. Look at their World Series odds right now. Yeah. Plus 25,000, just like it was in mid July. So, right now, those bet MGM odds are like, Listen. this is not a team because they're not going to do this unless they think this is a team that's like not even going to sniff playoff contention or even just make one of those surprise runs, right? Like, this is not good. This is where you buy high. And when they get Blake Snell, then you <laughs> <laughs> oh, <by> the <laughs> my, my, here, I tell you what, here's a better bet. Here's a just better kidding. bet for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> They, they lost what? They lose a hundred. They lost a hundred games last year. Was it one hundred and one? Last well, year, I think hundreds, it was. Yeah, yeah. I'll I know it was it over a hundred. Will they win? Will they lose a hundred games? Is a better bet. Will they? Will it? Will they lose more over or less than they wins. lost yeah. last year? <clears throat> we got to do that one. They were one hundred and one, by the way. Um, yeah, over under a hundo. Hmm. I think they might be there. You think they might lose a hundred again? I think I if I had to pick right now, yeah, unless something Oof. else crazy happens. Oof. Gosh, another rough year of being a White Sox fan. Thanks, God. <laughs> That's really not gonna, it. Doesn't mean it's <laughs> gonna happen because I said so. Yeah. No, I know, but I mean just the just the fact that you said that that quickly is what scares you, right? Yeah. As a fan. If you ask someone know. that, they should be like, Oh hell no. Well, yeah. they ain't losing a hundred again, but you're like, oh, I think they might do it. That's like, oh yeah. no. I I think they might too. So I do think maybe you improve some of what's gone on behind the scenes there. But like we talked about earlier, you do have to have talent too. And the big one for me that puts it over the top is Dylan Cease. I think he is going to be traded over the next few weeks. 
And that is your guy right now. And he, he did not have a great year, although there's some other factors involved, including really bad defense behind him. But he, he did not, by his standards, not even close, have a good year. But in my mind, if they're going to get off of the 100 loss conversation, it's because Dylan Cease goes back to the 2022 version. And he might, but I don't think he's going to do it on the White Sox. So they're doing another little teardown. There's nothing better as a new GM than proposing your five-year plan. So I do think that's probably what we're looking at for this team. I, I like the switching it up. I like some of the guys that they bring in that have some upside. You know, a Mike Soroka, who was brilliant early on in his career and then went through a ton of injuries. But overall, I just don't see it. I mean, they took away much more in terms of talent from their team. I mean, you know, even a, a Garrett Crochet, another guy coming off a bad year, if you look at the ERA, but the, the years before that, it's a really effective reliever when he's on the field. So I just think there's not enough talent there to convince me otherwise. You look at the rest of the division, the Twins haven't done shit, but they're still good. The Guardians are definitely better than them. They'll probably be about the same, and they have one of the better farm systems. I don't love Cleveland, but they're definitely a much better team than the White Sox, and they'll give them problems. When you start looking at the bottom of the division is when it becomes a problem. I think Kansas City is going to be better. They did shit this offseason, and it's another team that they've struggled to find good pitching. But, I mean, another year of Bobby Witt, MJ Melendez, and then, of course, you bring in a Seth Lugo, Michael Waka, etc. They're going to be better than the White Sox. So, yeah, for me, AJ, it's a great question. I put them in the same realm, like low hundos, like maybe 100, 101, something like that. I'm, I'd be curious to see when we get closer to the start of the season, what their over under is when we play those games and um, what the bet MGM odds have them at, but I'm, I'm going, I'll go one Oh one just like last year. Wow. Thanks guys. Thanks. <laughs> what about you? They're going to win the division. Well, you should probably <laughs> throw down a hundred bucks, and get 25 G's back then. Oh, I wish I could say that with a straight face. Um, yeah, it's, it might be another rough year for the old White Sox. Um, as much as I, I, I like some of the moves they made, bummer for in Soroka and all those guys. Uh, Fetty was great in, in KBO. Uh, I just, I, I still wonder, you know, where the offense is going to come from. Uh, Maldonado, if he plays enough, isn't going to hit. Is he going to hit enough? Um, just I'd like to see some other moves where they actually spend more money, um, but that's not their M.O., and they got to find some players. You know, Montgomery's coming. Uh, their shortstop prospects, Noah Schultz, a big lefty's coming. So, you know, but gosh, you know, it just it's they just went through a long rebuild. They made the playoffs two years ago, and now it looks like they're going through another one, even though they won't call it that. So it's it's a rough time to be a Pale Hose fan now, but, hey, fans, we stick together. We stick through it, and uh, – Let's go White Sox. We're going to do a little uh, bottom feeder therapy right now before we do slap hands. <laughs> so we have a few minutes for a breaking news signing as uh -oh. I'm getting some notifications on Twitter. And of course, our awesome FT fam throwing it up really quickly that uh, outfielder. I'll read this one from Bob Nightingale. Outfielder Joey Gallo gets another shot after his offensive struggles the past three years. He signs a one year contract. Wait, let, with me, let me think. What, you're going to guess who he National signed with? National or American League? It is the National League. Cincinnati Reds. Nope. <sighs> AJ, you want to guess and probably you'll look down and just have the answer? I don't have it on mine. I, I already know who it is, so I can't. I'm uh, not go ahead. Announce it, AJ. I mean, it's it's uh, the team I said was going to make a splash. This wasn't a splash that I was counting on, but it's the Washington Nationals. And, man, mm -hmm. I wish I could hit 190 or 170 or 140 or whatever it is and – Keep signing million dollar contracts because that would have been a fun that would have been a fun life. Five million One plus year, incentives. Five million. According yeah, to John still. Heyman with the money. Wow. The year no, before no, you was said the million. I, I said five. No, millions, <laughs> millions, millions. Oh, millions. Because the year before yes. the twins he signed, remember? After he had the contract with the Yankees. 11. And he went, yeah. And he hit what? 140 the year before, and then he did it again. I mean, te man, teams are just they're, they're, eventually though, I guess they'll find a hitting Guys, coach that can figure it out. You're not signing Joey Gallo for his batting average. No, you're, what are you signing him for? You're signing for his power potential. So Hopefully potential better gets you on paid. the on-base percentage front. He is a great athlete. So I mean, all, you, hey, you should be his agent, Scott. Him, right? I, 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 hey, I, how about this? Do you know what his OPS plus was last year? 100 league average? What do you think he was at? It should be about 40, but it won't be. 95. He had a 177 batting clip last year. His OPS plus was... 101. Yeah. You know what that tells me? 
Walks are so overrated, and OPS <laughs> plus is not the stat you should base your decisions off of. Yeah. Okay. I'm serious because think about it. Yeah, I get there's – yeah, it's a stat. He was above a league average hitter, 177 last year. How many homers did he hit? I don't have his thing. I got it all for you. 21 homers, 40 RBIs, but only about half a season's worth of plate appearances. He was at 332 plate appearances, 282 at-bats. He had 142 punch outs. So every um, other time he walked walks. into the plate, he punched out. Correct. So he punched out a hundred half the time. He hit 20 homers. So hey, don't hate the player, hate the game. Baby. No, I'm I'm not <laughs> hating. I'm just saying it's a yeah. it's there's certain stats that like you can you can tweak to make a guy look good or bad. And this yeah. is one of them. Like he's not an above league average hitter for me. It's my opinion. Joey Gallo is a nice yeah. guy. Listen, he's a nice sure. guy. I mean, he's a great guy. He's a super athlete. You know, he's all the things Scott, his agent, said. Uh, he plays good defense when he's out there. But, I mean, you know, I feel like there's a million guys you can find that can go up there and hit 170 and try to hit a home run every time. I don't know. True. I mean, I played with him in Texas. Loved him. I, Did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For a little bit. Give me the scouting report on, on old Joey as a person and, and what you saw. He, Obviously, because no, you man, probably had worked, him for some bro. glory days. Yeah, he, what year was it? 20 2000 so, right the covid year okay so he, 2020 he, i mean he, um, he's, was... he's undercover for one of the funniest dudes you'll ever meet too right he's witty um you know he's a little crazy too which i like so hopefully i brought some goodness out of him i'm i'm, I'm happy for him like adrian he's happy for everybody yeah it's it's one of those i think could be could be lightning in a bottle for the nationals all of a sudden he has a resurgence, gets something tweaks with his swing, and understands that doubles are good too, like all that stuff. No, it could be, it could be a really good pickup for him. So happy for him that he made this deal. Because guess what? It's getting late. It's getting late, and it's getting late. So if you could find something like this and he can get this done, sign me away. Let's go. You know, now they platoon him. I, I think that they were starting to do that, right, last year with Minnesota. So just let him hit against right-handed pitching. Start to kind of put him in the right situation, or at least to help out. You, you think the the teams haven't done that? The teams haven't done that for the last few years? They've been trying this. Yeah, the Dodgers did that, right? The Twins did it last year. I know. I mean, listen, I I'm happy. That. Listen, get every dollar you can. I'm happy that Joey Gallo keeps getting chances. It's just – it's amazing to me that that he keeps getting chances. I mean, I'm happy for him. Like, I like. Yeah. I mean, he was in – when I was with the Rangers, he was a young pup just out of high school as a draft pick, and I got to talk to him. He was awesome. Greg Maddox called me over and goes, hey, I want you to watch this kid hit. And it was Joey Gallo, and I was like, damn, that dude's got some pop. And then they were like, yeah, look at his numbers. And I did. And then he became what he became. And it just, but listen, get every dollar you can, Joe. You're, mm -hmm. I, I like you as a person. This is not, I, I'm just saying, it's just amazing. Yeah. That, I, I, I would say this might be his last big chance, though, too, as well. So, big chance. I yeah. Would say. <laughs> for um, sure. I, I will I will I say think also, he would agree with that as as knowing what he's been through. Yeah, for regular ABs and all of that, and obviously getting millions mm -hmm. of dollars. Like if it's a total flub of year, you have to remember that this wasn't a total flub of a season, at least according to many front offices. That's what they're looking yeah. at. <laughs> they say, hey, he's got league average offense for us, and you gotta take a heavy dose of K's and the fact that I mean he's a fresh 30 years old and he's had a lot of success in the past. Yes, super heavy strikeout guy, but he's capable of 40 plus homers yes. and the Washington Nationals signed a player a year ago who was coming off a season where he hit 217. His OPS plus was 81 in 2022, a 272 on base percentage. Do you know who that for the same money? Do you know who that player was? Lane Thomas. Jamer Candelario. Oh, nice. <laughs> he had okay. a great year for the Nats. They were able to flip him for some prospects from the Cubbies. I will get, say this for the Nats. You sign players like this who you feel like still have something left in the tank and give them everyday bees because you're not going to be a playoff contender this year. And this is just like we're talking about with Chapman and the Pirates. If you're one of those teams and you're trying to build yourself back up, you can't just sit around in the offseason. You still have to do something. You're not going to necessarily spend or convince certain players that now is the time. But Gallo's kind of the perfect guy for a situation mm -hmm. like this. It's low pressure. And if it works out, they get a couple prospects out of it, which is a huge win for the Nationals. Right? Yes, sir. True. Agree. To agree. Candelario was one of the big success stories from a signing perspective. Yeah. He, he turned around and got himself a little three-year 45 action from the Reds just now. Whoopsie.
Yeah. All right, so we, we broke away for a while there for some breaking <laughs> news, but let's swing it back to a little uh, BetMGM action to uh, the BetMGM Sportsbook account holders who uh, want to be in the Playoff Football Challenge. You can create an entry in the Million Dollar Playoff Football Challenge with an opportunity to win a share of a million bucks in bonus bets if you predict the three playoff football questions correctly out of the eligible users. Each entry period has three questions, so... Get into the app, go to the uh, promotions tab and go submit an entry and check that out. And one entry per customer is permitted per entry period. Gambling problem or concern, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Now, we have the winter poker open going down on Wednesday afternoon, right after the show. AJ and myself will be actively on social media, um, especially on the BetMGM poker account. So if you want to see... AJ trash talking some of the best poker pros on the planet, then stay tuned tomorrow. We'll give you more information. AJ and me will be on from Borgata tomorrow for the show. We'll do some hall of fame wrap up. And if you missed us earlier, Ken Rosenthal and Tim Kirkjian included on the guest list for tomorrow's show. Slap hands. Let's do it. All right, AJ, you ready? You want to do a fake Kratz hat? I like your hat today. <laughs> there it is. Get it. Oh, FoulTerritoryShop.com. We, we had a pretty wacky day. Uh, Same I'm one looking... from the first show. 250 today, by the way. What's 250? I think this is our 250th show today, isn't it? Is it? Oh, shit. I'm not good at that. But yeah, all right. If it is, awesome. Great. 250 so. shows already. Is that what someone said? Someone in the chat will tell us at some point. I thought it was, um, yeah. I could, I'm probably wrong. But. No, you're right. You're right. This is show 250. Yeah, good for me for noticing. I was yeah. just looking at the outfield depth chart. I'm like, oh, Jerry Gallo is going to get a lot of playing time until James Wood <laughs> gets called up. I'm telling you, he's going to get a Let's shot. Go. He had a big Let's April. Go. We'll see what happens. Uh, we're on at Bergata on Wednesday, tomorrow's show. So we'll see everyone Is it then. just me and you? It's just you just and I? you and me, dude. You and me. Wow. One on one. No, two on two. You and me against Kirkajin and, and Kenny Ballgame. We could take them, dude. I would love to dunk on <laughs> Rosenthal's head. Oh, uh, the bullies against uh, the uh, brains. So we'll say everyone for tomorrow. By the way, man. good luck to everybody. Hall of Fame. Yes. Voting. Adrian, congratulations. You're in. Uh, yeah, exactly. The other guys, good luck and congratulations to whoever get in. Well deserved. We're coming back on with some clips, so look at the FT channel soon in the next few hours. We'll have the real talk coverage for you, as usual. See you soon. Happy New Year.